joy it is to gather here under the promise that God is amongst his people when we gather for the purpose of worshiping him um, and celebrating his kingdom that has come to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And so I'm grateful that you're here with us today and that we have the opportunity to come together, join our hearts and our voices to sing God's praises. I'm Pastor Brady Johnston. This is Pastor April Failer. We're grateful to have the chance to worship with you and thankful for those of you who are joining us online for worship. And so uh, with that, let's stand and sing together. And good morning. Thank you for singing with us already this morning. If you want to grab a hymnal and turn to page 45, or if you just want to follow along on the screen, we're going to begin this morning with God of grace and God of glory, and we're going straight into how great thou art this morning. So join us as we worship in song.
have any youngsters today coming on to godly play? There we go. Y'all come on down. All right. Well, let's have prayer together as you get ready for a godly play. Would y'all bow with me? God, you are indeed great. We thank you for being the God who loves us, who calls us together to celebrate you, your faithfulness, and your goodness. And so we pray that you would be with our children and be with us as we continue to draw near to you. Would you, in turn, draw near to us? We pray this in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand for our affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. bow in prayer together. Almighty and gracious God, we come here to give you thanks for your generosity that is given to us. We know the heart of the gospel that brings us here is one of great generosity. For Jesus, though he was rich, as Paul says, made himself poor so that through his poverty we might become rich. And we are thankful that you have, because of the gift of Jesus and his life for us, made us truly wealthy when it comes to abundant life. And so it is with gratitude that we who are rich give back to you and your kingdom and what you're doing in the world to promote your name and to lift up all that you are and all that you are doing in the world, that others may come to know the life that is truly life in Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen.
before we turn to prayer together, I just want to take a moment to celebrate one of uh, what I consider one of our great ministries in the church. Uh, when we think of our church body, we often think of the three worship services that take place every Sunday here on our campus. Um, but our body actually extends beyond the walls of the church um, because we have a group of people who have heard the call of Jesus to provide a, an opportunity for worship, an opportunity for community, an opportunity for discipleship at three of the assisted living centers in Midlothian. And every Sunday, um, these people from our church, members of our church, go to each of these places and they provide an opportunity for, for the residents there to look upon the promises of God for them and to be encouraged in their life and in their faith. And this is really an amazing gift. Um, it is an amazing gift as a church to be able to offer because the call of Christ to the church is, is to go and to reach new people with the good news of Jesus. It's to go and make disciples. And that's what you are doing. People in our church are, are going and doing that. And, and not only are they being obedient and faithful, and we as a church doing that, like there's, there's something I think about that God says often, and especially the prophets of the Old Testament, that there is great blessing when, when the people of God remember those who, who society often forgets or undervalues. And for a demographic that's easily forgotten in our culture, easily neglected, um, we've heard the call of Jesus to be an encouragement and to go and share the good news. And so um, when we think of our, our body who gathers here and the 300-plus people that gather on our campus every week, there's another you know, 30 to 50 people outside these walls who are being encouraged uh, with the gospel. And so I just want to celebrate that. I want to thank everybody who gives their time because um, they come here and then they go there. <laughs> and so thank you for our care ministers for, for your ministry. Um, but let's, let's go to God in prayer together. Um, Father, what great joy there is to celebrate your heart and the mission that you've given us. God, we know that you call us to go to those who are forgotten and who are not valued because you want them to know that you are the God who sees them, that you are the God who hears their desperate prayers that you are the God who calls and compels your people to go and to encourage and to bless in the name of Jesus. We know that, Lord, your spirit is behind every message that's shared, every prayer that is prayed, every song that is sung, every time they gather around the table to remember the story of not only Jesus, your sacrifice and love, that was given for us. But as they celebrate the promise of the life to come, a life with a place at your table. And so thank you. Thank you for speaking loudly enough to us that we could hear and giving us hearts that desire obedience, that want obedience more than we want our own comfort because it is always more comfortable to sit on the sidelines than it is to get involved in the game. And so thank you, Jesus, for trusting us, your church, to be about your work. Remind all of us here that we were created for the purpose of being actively involved in the good world that you have created. And Jesus, when we come to you in faith, you give us a new purpose in life. And it's a restoration of, of that first calling to be involved in your work, your good work in the midst of a broken world. And every time we participate in this, Lord, we participate in your heart. We align with your values and we go and seek to do good in your name to not only bring you glory, but to point to others that, God, you are doing a good thing in the midst of a broken world. And that the good things that we do point not only to a good and great God, they point to the good and glorious future that you have in mind for this world. 
And we proclaim to, to a world that can so easily fall into despair as we look at the brokenness that there is hope. And so we ask, God, that you would continue to open our ears. Open our ears to the needs in our community. Open our ears to the ways in which you are calling us to be present with those who are forgotten. And give us the courage to be a church that always says yes. That always seeks to be generous. And that longs to do your will above all other things. This is the prayer that we give to you because we believe it's the way that Jesus calls us to live and that it's even the way he calls us to pray. Not only giving worship and praise to you and lifting high your will, but you teach us to pray and to love our neighbors. And so we come to you with this great prayer and let it be our heartbeat as a church, as we share it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
All right. Thank you, choir, uh, for that gift. Uh, we come today to another one of Jesus' great parables for us in Luke chapter 12. We'll be looking at verses 13 through 21. Uh, so I invite you to turn there. And the this, this series, uh, we've been in Jesus' parables for several months, and we've still got several months to go uh, because Jesus loved teaching in parables. Parables invite us to think about truths in a different way. Uh, parables, because they are narratives, often resonate in our heart and, and say things that maybe just a, a even to the point teaching might miss. And so uh, we're, we're grateful for the, the gift of these. And our, the greatest gift that we can give to God is for our ears and our hearts to be open. To hear that we might just say, yes, Lord, and, and be obedient to all that he has called us to. So looking in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus said, Man, who appointed me judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. So this parable that we're looking at today, the parable of the rich fool, emerges out of uh, really a request from someone in Jesus' audience for him to intervene in a dispute over the inheritance. And just with that, many of you are having flashbacks to a similar experience in your life because you know firsthand how the opportunity to grab some money just brings out the best in humanity, doesn't it? <laughs> like, man. <laughs> what's, what's interesting about this is that when Jesus actually speaks to it, you'll notice that Jesus doesn't even get into what is the actual circumstance that's brought before him. That he shows almost no interest in, into speaking into the circumstance itself. Instead, what Jesus chooses to speak into is what he sees in the man's heart. He speaks into the heart. In fact, he, he speaks not only to the man, but he speaks to everyone. Jesus' language changes from the you to the, to the all of you, to the the, the Greek would say y'all, or actually Texas and say y'all. But, but he says all of you. Like, and, and what does Jesus say? He says, watch out. The first thing he says, watch out. And, and the word here means actually to look, means to see or, or to look intently, which we would probably use the word stare. It is, it is to look with intention and to look deeply into something. And what Jesus says is this circumstance is thrust into his lap. He says, actually, all of you need to stop and you need to look into your own hearts. And let's be honest, like that's easier said than done for many of us. I was thinking about that this week and, and my girls are in like a, pop music phase, which is just a gift uh, to hear in your house all, 
all day long. And one of the songs they were listening to is Taylor Swift. Um, I'm sure I got a lot of Swifties out here, all right? Um, but there's a lyric in one of her songs called Antihero that, that I think just captures how, how hard this is. And she says in this, um, I'll stare directly at the sun, but never in the mirror. Now, I'm not a Taylor Swift scholar, nor can I peer into her own mind, but I'll, I'll tell you what I hear in that. Um, I hear her saying, I will look at something that is physically painful to me before I stop to look into myself. Like, look, most of us, when you were kids and there was an eclipse, what was the first thing you heard? Don't look at the eclipse. It'll blind you, right? And what did we do? <laughs> like, we walked outside, and we did this, and we would crack our finger, you know, and just... And we would look at it and we'd be like, I didn't get blind. I, it didn't blind me. And we felt like it was a victory, right? Like we will risk physical blindness before most of us will stop and look at the mirror to assess and examine like what's really in the depths of our heart and the motivations for our living. Like we'll, we'll look at the sun, but man, we won't even stop to give a glance at the mirror and what Jesus says is, no, like, like you need to live and examine life. And part of the discipline is that you need to be willing to look into the mirror. And you need to have the courage to draw out what is actually lurking in, in the depths of our hearts that we often don't want to admit is there. And, and what is it that Jesus says we need to be looking for? Greed. He says, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Not, not just greed, but, but all kinds, all the forms of greed. And what is greed? I mean, greed in, in the scriptures is an excessive desire for more. We often associate it with possessions or material things, that we have this desire for more stuff. And that certainly is a part of greed, but it's not just that. That greed is a driving desire for more power. It's a driving desire for sometimes satisfaction and joy in our life. That we have this kind of thing where we, we pursue and we want this. And, and the Bible often thinks of greed um, as, as putting goods in the place of God. That taking that place where our affections and our hopes and our greatest love is God himself, we, we put him out of that position and we put something material, something that we can seek or gain, and we put it in that place. Um, and we think that that, that that thing, whatever it is, becomes something that can give us life. And in Jesus contends against that in the same verse. He, he says, look, life doesn't consist in the abundance of possessions. And what Jesus does here is, is he speaks to what is the driving force behind greed as it overwhelms the human heart. I think we would agree, and, and not only do the scriptures tell us this, but Every psychologist and sociologist, like anybody will tell you that everyone who's walking on the face of this earth is looking for a satisfaction in their life. That every person has this longing that is knit within their own soul that we want life and we want a kind of purpose that leads to a, a rich Life, a life that is rich in purpose and meaning. And, and here's the thing, because this is a desire within every one of us. When we believe that there is something that can lead us to that kind of life, what happens is we put all of our hopes and all of our affections upon whatever we believe that is. And all of a sudden, our life becomes about pursuing and gaining whatever we've put our hopes upon. 
And when we look at it this way, we see that, that, that whatever we're hoping in, like whatever we think will deliver us life, becomes the driving force behind our life. And everything that we do, all the resources that we have, will go towards trying to gain that. And we see that this is a common belief, and I think we hear this over and over again um, as we, we think about the message that we hear in our world. But Jesus says that's not life. That's not where you find life. You see, in the Christian faith, life isn't something that we gain. It's not something that we earn or something that we get. Life, as we are all seeking it, is a gift. It's a gift that is given to us. And Jesus says, life, you're, you're not going to find it if you're trying just to, to satisfy this need for more. And so Jesus goes on to tell a story, and it's a story um, that brings home this point. And, and it's a story that it, it has to do with greed. You'll, you'll see it in the story. Maybe you hear it as you think back on it. But it's actually about more than just greed. It's actually a story about life. It's a story about where we find true and abundant life. And the story goes, uh, a rich man, an already very wealthy man, has an incredible harvest one year. And it presents him with a quandary. This man who is probably sitting at the top 1% of, of all the Jewish people, especially in the region of Galilee, presents him with a quandary. What do you do when you are already wealthy and you have an abundant harvest, more grain than you know what to do with? Well, the obvious answer to Jesus' listeners and the biblical command, the, the vision that the Old Testament gives us of what you would do in an instant like this, is that you would keep some. You would sell some. And then you would give some to people who have need. It's what the Old Testament would tell us we should do with an abundant harvest like this. But what does he do? He keeps it all for himself. And, and Jesus lets us know a little bit about the motivation of this keeping it all. And you can begin to catch the motivation in verses 17 through 19. And I want to read it again, and I want you to listen. I'll, I'll emphasize what I want you to hear in these verses a little bit more in this reading. Here's, here's his motivation for keeping all of this. He thought... To himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And then I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy Eat, drink, and be merry. Did you hear it? In three verses, he references himself 13 times. 13 times in three verses. That is no accident that Jesus tells us the story that way. What Jesus says is the reason that he chooses to store up for himself rather than taking some, selling some, and giving some is because all that he can think about is himself. I mean, the conversation that he has is with himself, about himself. Like, you, you can't get any more self-centered than that. And part of what Jesus is saying is, look, the danger of greed is that it makes you self-centered. That excessive desire for more is, is bound to make you a, a life that, that is centered around yourself. That's what greed does to us. Jesus looks at greed and he says the danger is that greed's a lot like salt water. Every human being, we have this desire, this need for, we have a thirst that comes up, but salt water, you drink it 
And it doesn't satisfy the thirst, does it? In fact, the more you drink, the more you want, and you'll keep drinking it until it kills you. And Jesus says that the danger of greed is it makes you self-centered. It, it reduces your life to a want in something you've put your hope in. And what happens is you'll become so fixed on it, you'll become spiritually blind, and you'll keep chasing it until you run off a cliff, and you'll never even know it. So Jesus he warns us here against this. And, and if we're not already getting the point now, like he even cements it further in verse 19, when he tells us what is the life purpose of the rich man, the way he sees his life. He says, I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. This idea of eating, drinking, and be merry was thought of in the ancient world as the best you could do in this life. That the ultimate goal for any human being, knowing that you have arrived, is the fact that you can sit back in life and you have enough to not worry. That you have enough just to sit back and, and relax. That you are secure in everything that you have. And, and this was the aim. And I don't know that things have changed all that much. But feel free to tell me if you disagree. I think for many of us, like we look at that and we think, yeah, I'll, I'll take that too. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> To sit back and not have to worry, to have a life of comfort and, and ease. And, and it seems like, like this guy has arrived. I mean, it feels like on this day when he realizes, all I have to do is just build bigger barns and I'm set for years. It feels like he's arrived and, and yet just when he gets there, God says to him, You fool! This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Boy, this, this line right here, it tells us what's scary about this parable. And I think the scary thing about this parable um, is that Jesus makes it clear that this man is not what we would consider a bad or an evil person. He, he doesn't get things through, he doesn't gain all that he has through immoral means. He doesn't do anything, he doesn't treat anybody unfairly, he doesn't harm anybody in the process of, of gathering things for himself. He plays by the rules, right? Right? And so what Jesus shows us in this parable is, is that it's not that this man is unjust. The problem is that he's a fool. And what Jesus tells us about why he's a fool, he's a fool because he lives for himself. Because he's the center of his own universe. And because everything he has and everything he gets in his life, he looks to serve himself with. Every resource becomes about investing in a life of security, in a life of comfort, in building himself up at the expense of being able to share and bless with other people around him who have needs. He invests, he invests in a life of security and ease for himself. And Jesus says it's at a cost to yourself. In the words of Jesus, just a few chapters before this, in Luke 9, 25, Boy, they just resonate here, don't they? That you can gain the world and yet lose your very self in the process. And Jesus says, that's what you've accomplished. You think you've accomplished something by building bigger barns. Man, in the pursuit of this, you ran off a cliff. And I think it's worth stepping back for a moment and just being real honest here. Like the temptation 
in this parable is to look at this rich guy and just say, rich people, what are you going to do with them? You know, um, go figure, right? Top 1% just in it for themselves. You know, overcome by this greed and, and lust for more. But, but man, I, I think we missed the point. If we just stop there and make him the villain in this story. Because if you remember Jesus, he, he doesn't just point out the brother who's got the problem. He, he looks at everybody in the crowd. He says, all of you, you need to watch out. Because this is easy in the world we're in to fall into this. And so he says, all of us need to, to stop. We, we need to do the hard thing and look in the mirror and examine the heart for any kind of greed like this that can just so easily and, and deceptively slip into our lives. And it can be such a subtle, it's a powerful desire, but it's a subtle one and can be hard to diagnose in our own lives. Jesus says, you need to stop and look at your, don't just look at the rich guy, look at yourself. Because I'll, I'll, I, let's just be honest. Be honest as a church. I think for some of us, man, and, and, and for the church, for, for some of us, a life of comfort and security has become an idol. I think like the idea of just eating and drinking and being merry, like that is the, the aim for us. It's not just for the rich man. It can be for us. That if I could just get there, then, then I would be living. And man, I think, yes, in the church, we struggle with materialism. I think that, that there are Christians who certainly will buy into the idea that that more will, will fill them eventually, that bigger and better will, will certainly give them the life that they want. I think there is that struggle that exists within the church as well. But I'll tell you my experience as a pastor, and even looking into my own heart, I think the biggest danger is living a life of comfort where we begin to look at everything that we get, everything that God graciously gives us, and we think, how can I serve myself? How can I provide more comfort and more ease and more security so that I will finally be at peace? And, and Jesus says that that isn't where life is found. That's not the life purpose for God's people. It's not the purpose for, for Jesus' disciples. That our pursuit isn't, isn't a life of comfort and ease. It's not a, a life of just having more or what our neighbors have. The, the purpose of, of the life of Jesus' disciples is fruitfulness. And Jesus is so clear with this in John 15 when he, he meets with the disciples. And this is, again, the, the dialogue, the teaching that Jesus gives the disciples just hours before he's arrested and ultimately crucified. And Jesus says, this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. It's to my Father's glory. You don't live for your glory. You live for the Father's glory. And, and you seek to, to give. You seek to be fruitful in the eyes of the Father to bring him glory. Your life isn't about comfort and ease. It's about fruitfulness for the kingdom because that's the life that matters. Because every one of us will eventually be the rich man. And this life that we have on this earth will end. And nothing that we gain, not power or possessions, can we take with us. Our real life is up there. That's the life that continues. And Jesus says, may you, you begin to look at your life as how can I be fruitful? How can I live? Yes, the life that God has given me here, which requires resources in my investment, but I'll never put all my chips in on this life. But I'll seek to invest in the life to come, which is, my really, which is really my life. And that's part of what Jesus does in verse 21. 
is Jesus gives us a vision. It's not only a warning of, of don't just be the person who's rich towards yourself and gathering for yourself. Jesus says, be rich toward God. Be rich toward God. Don't just seek to gather things for yourself, but, but seek to be a generous person to God and, and his kingdom. And that's an interesting idea, the, the idea of being rich toward God. And, and I think it's Paul who explains really well what this means for us in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. Paul says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in their wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put your hope upon God, who richly provides for us everything for our enjoyment. And command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Did you hear it, man? Being, being rich in good deeds and generous and willing to share. You want the recipe for the life that is truly life, then that's it. And what Jesus and Paul begin to hold in front of us is they call us not to a life of gathering just for ourselves, but a life of, of being rich toward God. What they begin to push us toward is to a life of generosity. It, it's a, a life of understanding that one of the greatest gifts we have is that we have been given and blessed by all that we need and more from our Heavenly Father, and that we have the opportunity to be generous back to Him. And there's really some genius in this, in the understanding of generosity here. Because generosity, I think, really does two things for us. Generosity is a way of guarding our hearts from greed. And, and it's also a way of bringing glory to God. If you want to know the surefire way of protecting your heart from an excessive desire for more, it's to let go of some stuff. It is. If, if greed is the accumulation and, and it's the, the three-year-old who's gathered the toys in the bin all to themselves and won't share, if that's greed, then, then the, the way to fight against greed is the willingness to begin to open your arms a little bit. It's the capacity to let go and to say, I don't need all of this stuff for myself. I can actually let go of some of it. And that's one reason why this is a part of our worship. It's why we include this. We have the ability to just make giving an online thing, but we pass the plates in in church for a reason, because we're giving you the practice of actually letting go, which is an act of faith. It's saying, God, you know, the world tells me this is the most important stuff in my life. That my financial treasure and my money and my possessions, the world says you need more and more. In fact, you need more than you can get. So you got to keep it all for yourself. And yet when we come here and when we give, we're saying, I don't put my hope in that. I put my trust in my Father who gives me everything, and I trust Him to provide. I trust Him to give, me with enough, to give me enough, and so I'm willing to part with some of it to show that this stuff has no claim upon my heart, that I don't hope upon this. I need it for life, but I don't hope for it to give me life. And even beyond guarding our hearts against greed, it's also an opportunity. As we think about the resources of our lives, not just our financial treasure, but our, our time and our energy, the talents that we have and the skills that we've learned. As we think about all of those resources that God has given, we think about, God, how can I use these to bless you and your kingdom? What can I do in my life? What person, what neighbor needs my energy to invest in them this week? What resources can I give that can fund a mission that, that goes and 
reaches 50 people in our community who might otherwise be forgotten and neglected? How can I invest in what you're doing so that we can bring you glory in your world? And maybe, God, you're calling me to be one of those people. But this idea of, of generosity that Jesus and, and Paul hold out in front of us is the vision for our lives of fruitfulness. Like th- This is where life is found. Not in a life that shrinks because we're, we're pulling into ourselves, but in a life and a heart that, that can, can open up and bless. And so I think out of this, this word, man, there's a number of responses, I think, for us. I think for every one of us, there's the need to pause and be really honest in examining our own hearts. Do the hard thing to look in the mirror. Look, are there any kinds of greed that have infiltrated my heart? And, and then there's the question, um, Lord, I want you to help make me into a generous person. A person who looks at everything that is my life. All, all of my time and my energy and my talents, my financial treasure, that, that, that I don't pull into myself in these things, but I look at my life and I say, yes, I need some of those things for me. Yes, uh, I might need also to release some of these things to you, back to you. And so we come to God open ears to hear him speak into our lives. And you're welcome if you want to come down in our prayer or even during the song um, to pray at the altar here. Um, You're welcome to do that. We invite you to. um, Or you can stay praying in your seats. But let's turn to our Father in heaven in prayer. Jesus, as we look to an example of someone who was rich toward God, who is fruitful, who sought to bring glory to the Father, we look to you. And you emptied yourself so that we might become rich through all that you gave. We want that kind of heart as your people. We want to be the kind of people who look at the resources and everything that you've put into our hands and looks at our lives for more than the purpose of serving our own desires. We want to look at it and say, God, how can we invest in you and your kingdom? This is what it means to be a steward. And Lord, you're the one who knows what we need, what we're called, what we're given in order to enjoy, and you know what we need to invest back into you and your work in the world. Lead us to understand. We long for obedience and we long for life and we know that life is found when we're the people who are freed. Who are freed from the lesser narratives the world has to offer us. But instead looks to you with joy and an openness of spirit that's excited about the opportunity to be a part of what you're doing in the world. A heart that wants to bless you with eyes to see our neighbor and hearts to go and meet their needs. Help us become these kinds of people, a people who reflect Jesus, our Savior. And so we ask you through your spirit to do this work to open our eyes, to look into our hearts, and to perform a transformation in the hearts of every one of us. We pray this in your great and wonderful name. Amen. Uh, I invite you to stand and sing together as a church.
Well, no, thank you for being here. We have just a really couple announcements. Uh, one of those is that we have an event tonight, uh, 5.30, and it's our, our launch for our new discipleship group. So our discipleship groups is a small group ministry um, where we invite a, a small group of people to join together with being like-minded in searching the scriptures, not only to understand, but also to apply and be transformed. And so um, if you're interested in being a part of that, thinking, gosh, I'd love to read scriptures together in a small community where we can talk about them and dive into life and application, uh, then we invite you to come uh, tonight. Uh, it's at 5.30, and you'll be done before the kickoff. So if you're thinking, well, man, the <laughs> cowboy kickoff's at 7, you'll be done. Like, you just come, and we're going to have fried chicken, and it'll be great. Um, and so if you're just interested, you're not, you don't have to buy into it. Just if you're interested in hearing more about what that might look like, and uh, we have several groups that are ready to open, um, that have, or new groups uh, with leaders who are ready for you, and we're excited about that. Uh, we'll have a, we also invite those who are part of discipleship groups to come, and you'll have a chance to talk to people who have been in them and to see the blessing it's been in their life. Um, also, if you just want a free meal, you can come too. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you're interested or not, so you're welcome to come. Uh, like I said, you'll be done for the Cowboys kick off. Um, and so uh, I wore to celebrate today, the Cowboys start of the season. So um, we also have just another couple opportunities. One of those is that if you do want to dedicate a hymnal, one of our new hymnals to a loved one, um, there you can go online or fill out a form in the back, and it's $30 to do that. And we'd love to, to be able to help you with that. And uh, also, if you're a guest with us and you're kind of interested in our church and want to know more about our church, we have what we call Next Steps. Uh, we'll be in the Family Life Center at 945. Just sit in the blue chair somewhere and we'll gather up a spot. It's a chance to meet with Pastor April and myself just to answer your questions about the church and what's going on and who we are, whatever you want to bring to the table. It's very informal and we invite you to come and do that. Um, but I thank you for being here. If you're a guest with us, uh, Monica would love to bless you with uh, some cookies in the back. You won't want to miss that. So uh, go see her. Um, we're grateful that you are here. Um, but man, what a gift the Word of God is for us and how thankful we are for Jesus who calls us to do the hard thing, uh, to look inward in our hearts, to make a real assess assessment, to examine if there is anything in our heart that's leading us away from the life that is truly life. And may the Spirit work in us to make us a people who are truly generous that we look at everything we are in our life and, and we ask God, how can we bless you and bless those around us? Just imagine if we were a church who shared that in common. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we go. Amen. Let's sing one more time before we leave. Jesus.